Okay, well, oh, okay. All right, so we are official now recording and ready to go. So um, it's nice to see you all here. I just love Zoom and I love being able to do things that are long distance like this. I think it's really quite special. Um, uh, uh, let, let me just start by um, thanking um, the Niagara Frontier Watercolor Society. I thought that was pretty funny before. You call it NIFWIS. Yeah. <laughs> great. So I'll thank NIFWIS for, um, and especially Mike, um, for inviting me to um, present to you today. I just got this email out of the blue from Mike inviting me several months ago. And um, I was delighted and honored. So um, anyhow, thank you. And um, you know, thank you to also to everybody who's um, Zooming in. Um, I didn't see any familiar names, but that's not surprising since I'm from North Carolina. I, I assume most of you are New Yorkers um, living near Buffalo, perhaps, or in Niagara Falls. Um, I got to say, I looked at your website and was so impressed. What a fabulous organiz organization you have. Uh, so many meetings and shows and activities, just wonderful resources for your members and I saw many many fabulous paintings I looked back through some of your shows over the last few years wow we um so anyhow I gotta say I'm truly humbled to um be here um talking to you and, and painting for you so anyhow enough of that let's get on to the demo. Um, I actually am going to start by sharing my screen. And I'm just going to set that up for you in a minute. Here we go. All right. So I'm screen sharing now. And, and so I just, I just want to start by telling you that one of my favorite workshops that I teach is called anything but cold pressed. And in this workshop, we, we work on surfaces other than cold press which I think for most of us, it's kind of the go-to surface for watercolor. For many of us, most of us, that's what we used when we first got started. And I will say that I love cold pressed paper. These are just um, a few of my cold pressed papers. You can see I have a variety of different um, brands and weights. Um, they're all a little bit different. I reach for one or another at various times. Um, and I really do love cold press paper. Um, when I paint my figurative paintings or portraits, I almost inevitably reach for cold press paper because I want the control and the, the dependability, um, the consistency, you know, it's constant of cold press paper. Um, this is also cold press paper as is this. But now and then, I like to work on other surfaces. This is hot press paper. This is rough. Can you see all the bumps in the surface? You know, it's like crazy texture on hot on cold, uh, rough paper. Um, this is Upo. Upo is that plastic paper that um, some of us enjoy working on. This is called Aquaboard. This is watercolor canvas. And then we have this stuff, acrylic gesso. And that's what tonight's demo is going to be all about. I, when I was first talking with Mike about what to do for um, this event, um, I wanted to try to share something that might be new or different with you. And I thought, hmm, why don't I do a painting on gessoed watercolor paper. So that's what tonight, or I keep saying tonight, it's this afternoon. That's what this afternoon is going to be all about. So this is acrylic gesso. Acrylic gesso is essentially a primer um, used by um, oil and acrylic painters 
they painted onto raw canvas. Raw canvas by itself is way too absorbent. But the gesso, which has the consistency and the look of like white house paint, um, when you paint it on to raw canvas, it cuts down the absorbency. Um, and then it's fine for um, th their particular kinds of paint. Um, however, um, watercolor painters have decided, or some of us have decided, that it makes a really um, good surface for watercolor as well. And so that's what I'm going to share with you um, this afternoon. So here is, um, this is actually a screenshot of me putting acrylic gesso on a piece of watercolor paper. Um, I have a, a brief, I don't know, eight or 10 minute um, Zoom recording, which I'm happy to share with anybody, by the way, who's interested. And it's all about how to apply the acrylic gesso to your paper. So if any of you want to, um, oh, I don't know, shoot me off an email, um, I will be happy to share the link to that recording with you. I'm not going to do I'm not going to do it on camera tonight, though, this afternoon, though. So anyhow, so here I am putting acrylic gesso on a piece of watercolor paper. And here is um, just a, like a, a chart, if you will, that I put together. And I just want to go through this really quickly with you. So you have to, you can't, as far as I know, you can't buy pre-primed watercolor paper. You need to brush the gesso on yourself. It's not hard to do. It makes a really interesting and variegated surface. I like to paint it onto cold press paper for starters. And what happens after I put, let's say two or maybe three coats of gesso on the watercolor paper, I end up with a surface that has brush strokes on it from the two layers of gesso, as well as the little bumps from the original cold press paper that's underneath. And the end result is just really, really interesting. Um, uh, really quickly to go through the rest of this, because I do want to get to painting. Um, when you first start brushing on the paint or the water, you might experience a little bit of bubbling, but just keep going. And eventually the bubbles are gonna settle out and you can put your color on. Um, gesso paper does not buckle as much as untreated watercolor paper. Glazing's fine. Um, lifting is easy. And that's what I really love. One of the most wonderful things about painting on gesso paper is the ability to lift off pigments, especially when you're using non-staining pigments, which is mostly what I use, by the way. You can use all your regular techniques. You don't need masking fluid. Um, for anybody out there who is a real um, mm, determined, dedicated, transparent painter, watercolor painter, let me just say you might want to avoid uh, really, really dark values on gessoed paper because they do tend to start looking a little bit opaque. Um, hardly costs more than a regular piece of paper. And let me just say, you can recycle an old painting, cover it up with some gesso and you're good to go. Whole new surface. So, um, so that's a savings for sure. Um, acrylic gesso is archival, no worries about that. And in terms of framing, um, you ju just frame your um, paintings on gesso as you would any, any regular uh, watercolor on paper. I do want to say one thing about, and, and I know that your, the, your organization has a lot of um, exhibitions, and I'm sure that there are some of you enter um, regional, state, national, international exhibitions. Be really careful about entering paintings on gessoed watercolor paper because by definition, a painting done on gessoed watercolor paper is no longer purely watercolor. The gesso is acrylic. And as soon as you put that on your paper, even if you're painting watercolor on top of it, it is technically a mixed media painting. Mm -hmm. It's no longer pure unadulterated watercolor. So in terms of entering these paintings in exhibitions, you just need to check the rules really 
really quickly, really carefully and, and make sure that it truly is okay. Um, aside from that, no problems though. And it's great. So let's just move on. I wanna show you a few paintings that have been done on gessoed watercolor paper. And if I move in closely, can you see right here these streaks? Those streaks are from the, the actual physical texture of the gesso that I brushed on. Um, here you can see some in the elephant's skin as well. And um, for certain subjects, I think that the gessoed surface and some of the textures that it creates for you can really enhance the description and, the, and even the feeling of a painting. Here's another one, and here's an example of a painting with a lot of very dark shapes in it. And you can see, for instance, in the lower left corner here, which is very dark, it does start to become rather opaque looking. So again, if you are, you know, a, a, a real serious transparent painter, um, you might want to avoid, for instance, a subject like this. Um, you will discover in a few minutes how I made these lovely lights, the sun and the reflection. And this is one of the beauties of the paper. Another one on gessoed paper. And I put this one up to show you that even on this surface, it's very possible to get nice smooth passages. Might be a little harder than on cold press, yeah, but it's very possible. Another one on gesso. And I just want to say that um, I love painting abstracts. It's not my main thing, but I do love painting them. And they're just wonderful to paint on gesso, gesso watercolor paper. So another abstract and a third. All right. So, <laughs> okay. I've been here, you know, I imagine most of, most of you all on the call, on the call this afternoon live within a short drive of this amazing place. And I've been here, I've been there a couple of times in my life. And I have experienced the immensity, the power, the magnificent, the, I mean, it's just, it's just an amazing place. Um, so yeah, Niagara Falls. <clears throat> I am here in North Carolina, Greensboro. This is my city. It's kind of a medium-sized city, kind of in the center of North Carolina. And I just want to say that, you know, I might be having better weather today than you all up in um, Northwest New, New York. Yeah, the weather might be better. But just to make sure that you don't feel um, overly jealous <laughs> of me in Greensboro, I'm going to show you now my local waterfall. Ta-da! Here's <laughs> my, this is my local waterfall. You all have this and maybe it's a little colder there. I've got this. Yes, indeed. This is my local waterfall, which is in um, a park about two miles from my house. It's quite lovely. Oh, it is. Um, and I actually have to confess to you that it's not even a real waterfall. Um, it's completely manufactured, oh. completely ersatz. It's quite. It is quite a sweet little waterfall. But there, but it there used to be just a plain hill right here, and then some landscape designers and water waterfall designers came in and said, "Well, we can't do this." But we'll do this. So anyhow, but this is what I'm going to paint for you today. Um, so this is my response to all you folks up there near Niagara Falls. This is what I'm going to paint for you today. So I do want, before I start, I just want to say um, this little teeny waterfall is about four feet high. Um, you know, there, this um, this um, subject, however, is going to, it has some nice shapes in it. Um, it has a nice range of values. 
And it's going to give me the opportunity to really show off this unused, this unusual, non-traditional surface. Okay, so take a good look of, at this at this um, photo. In fact, feel free to take a screenshot if you want. When I get to actually painting in just a minute or two, I can't actually keep this picture up on the screen at the same time. So I want to make sure that you get a good look at this magnificent waterfall. <laughs> okay. Here's the way I start virtually every painting with a value study. So this is what I did. I'll show you my actual value study in a minute, which is only about three or four inches high. But this um, enables me to plan my, my major shapes, my basic value patterns. I do a lot of my designing and I make a lot of decisions about my painting before I ever reach for my watercolor paper, in this case, my gesso watercolor paper. Here's my drawing on my gessoed watercolor paper. And I do want to point out to you that if you look at this drawing, um, one thing that I enjoy doing when I'm drawing on gessoed watercolor paper, and I don't usually do this on standard, shall we say, normal watercolor paper, I smudge. The gessoed surface is a little bit gritty. Um, when you feel it, it, it just feels a little bit gritty and it grabs the graphite. I use um, like basically just like a number two pencil to make my drawing. And I draw, this was drawn freehand on the paper. Um, but the grittiness of the surface really grabs um, some extra graphite. And then it's really fun to smudge it around, especially for a subject like this. So all this smudginess was just done with my finger, pushing that graphite around a little bit. Now, I just want to talk to you about an underpainting because this is how I'm starting my painting. What's an underpainting and why would somebody want to do it? An underpainting is basically, um, I wet the whole piece of paper and then slosh on a lot of really uh, fluid, usually light value, high key value, different colors all over the painting. Um, most of the time for me, and I do, I do not do an underpainting for every single painting. Um, when I choose to do it, um, I usually cover most of the paper, maybe not every single speck, but most of it. Why do I do it? Well, sometimes I do an underpainting because I want to, let's say, establish an overall warmth or coolness, in this case, warmth. So here's a painting, and this, by the way, is standard cold press paper. Um, and here's the, here's the final painting. But I just wanna show you that this mostly warm underpainting, it's there, anything I put on top of it, that lovely warmth is going to infuse all the subsequent glazes, and it really helps to unify the painting. Um, so here's a cool underpainting, but you can also use an underpainting to start to express a feeling of weather or even a feeling of moodiness. And so here's the final painting. Um, sometimes with an underpainting, I'm thinking more in in broad terms, not too specifically, I'm not trying to paint specific shapes, but I'm thinking about coolness in one place, warmth in another, um, and here's the painting. Um, so an underpainting is really, it's quite helpful to get me started. And another thing that's great about an underpainting is you can just kind of knock back all that white paper and it makes you feel like you are on your way. So here's your painting now, your demo for today with an underpainting. And what I wanted to do here was to create a gradation from cooler at the top and gradually moving down to warmth at the bottom. And this is where I'm at now. I'm going to take you over to my... Um, actual painting now, here we go. So here's the painting and um, so here's the here's the underpainting. Um, what I'm gonna do really quickly, now I did the underpainting a few days ago. I wanted to have it done ahead of time because it takes a while to dry. Um, I, I actually 
believe that um, on gessoed paper, it takes longer to dry because the paint really doesn't sink into the surface the way it does on cold press. The paint and the water just stay on the surface. And so it does take longer to dry. So here's just a little piece of uh, gessoed paper. And I'm just gonna show you really quickly how I make my underpainting. So this is essentially the um, same drawing as your demo. And I just wanna show you. So I started underpainting by brushing on some water, really, really wet. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I will wet the paper with a spray bottle instead. So I can spray on a lot of water. But the whole idea is to get the surface covered with a lot of water and I can let the water kind of uh, slide around a bit. That helps to um, distribute it. And the water is literally sitting on the surface now with gessoed watercolor paper. It generally doesn't, again, it doesn't get absorbed. It's just gonna sit on the surface. So what I can do now is, let's say I wanna start it cooler at the top. Okay, there's a bit of cerulean blue a bit of ultramarine blue. Let's go warmer at the bottom, a bit of yellow ochre at the bottom. And can you see that the paint now, it really slides around. It's beautiful. Um, as it dries, it will to settle down. Here's a little bit of, a uh, little bit of burnt sienna, by the way. As it, as the surface dries, the paint will settle down. It'll stop moving as drastically and it will ultimately um, stick to the surface. It will, um, but very little goes beneath the surface, which gives you that um, flexibility for lifting, which you're gonna see in a few minutes, okay? So I'm gonna put this away. This was just to show you really quickly how I made my underpainting. I don't want you to feel like I'm keeping any secrets from you. This is what I did a few days ago on my big paper. Well, it's not that big. Underneath my Zoom camera, I'm kind of limited to about a quarter sheet. So this is 15 by 11 inches. Sometimes I go up to about, I go up to about a 16 by 12, but I can't go much bigger than that underneath my Zoom camera. I just wanna show you real quickly I keep my photograph. So here's that fabulous waterfall in Greensboro, North Carolina, once again, on my iPad. That's how I look at my source photo. And just to show you, here's the value study that I showed you before. And I'm gonna put my hand next to it. You can see how small it is. The whole idea with a value study is to make it small, do it fast, and don't get into too much fiddly detail. It's not necessary. This is big planning. Okay, here's my palette, which as I mentioned before, is um, mostly, mostly non-staining pigments. Even when I'm painting on regular cold press paper, I use mostly non-staining or not very heavily staining watercolor pigments. That's my choice. And it really works well. It really works well on the gesso paper. I'm gonna start with my darks, everybody. I don't always start with my darks, although I do get into my darks pretty quickly, pretty much always. But for today, I wanna start with my darks. And you might notice I'm using a one inch flat brush. And what I'm gonna do now is, this is where the waterfall is gonna be. I can pull in closer for you to see better. The waterfall is gonna be right about here, at about this position right here. That's where it's starting to cascade over. Oh yes, cascade. <laughs> Yes, indeed. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm taking some dark paint. This is um, ultramarine blue mixed with some burnt sienna, which is one of my favorite combinations for uh, neutrals or 
and, and for darks, it works well. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to start by painting with my big brush, my big, well, it's a one, in, a one inch flat, a pretty big brush. And um, I'm just going to start by putting dark paint. I'm essentially turning off this waterfall. And I got to say, I've actually seen it turned off, which is a little weird. But I'm essentially turning it off now as if there's no water coming over the waterfall. Because beneath the waterfall, it's quite dark. It's all stones and it's um, it's in a great deal of shadow. And so it's quite dark. So I'm just going to paint this shade and make it nice and dark. And um, I'm also going to take this dark and move it across into some of the adjacent stones. As I'm doing this, I'm noticing that it kind of looks like there's, a, there's some uh, moss or algae growing on some of these stones as I move to the left. And so I'm going to add a little green to my mixture on the palette. And let's keep that moving across. So I'm crossing the lines, which is something I love to do, by the way, crossing the lines um, and, and also changing some of the colors. Uh, now, right here, I've gotten to a place where there's just this little pool and the water kind of circulates through this little pool. And then it goes over another little, like a six inch waterfall. Are you all just so impressed with this waterfall? And <laughs> it's going, all right. So here we go. So I'm just going to take this uh, glaze. This is a glaze on top of my, you know, on top of my underpainting. And let's take it all the way out the bottom of the painting. By the way, I do want to mention that when I designed this painting, I was looking at my um, I was looking at my source photo. And of course, I've been to this place, this park many times, one of my favorite parks for taking my dog for a nice walk. So I've seen this place many times and as I was designing this, what I deliberately did was the lower left corner of the painting is going to have rocks in it. However, the lower right is going to have water in it. I try to, I try to make my corners different. I don't like to be too repetitive from one corner to the next. The two upper corners are going to have trees in them. And in fact, I'm going there now. So I'm going to pull in a little closer for you. All right, so now I'm going to go to the upper, the, the upper part of the painting. And what I want to do in the upper part is to um, right here in, uh, not exactly in the middle, towards the center, I want, I want to get some darker green up in the upper part of the painting it's all going to be trees it's a nice wooded park so let's i want to just get some darker green up here especially in the not dead center but towards the center of the painting if i lift it up if i lift the paint painting slightly it takes away some of the shininess as I move towards the left, the upper left corner, I'm going to add, oh, by the way, I was just using some ultramarine blue and uh, in here, ultramarine blue and some sap green um, mixed with some of that burnt sienna that was already on. Okay, as I'm moving into the upper left corner here, I'm warming it up with a bit of lemon yellow. So I don't want to have this green completely the same all the way, all the way across. 
as I move over to the right side of the painting, the upper right corner, I'm going to warm it up with a little bit of yellow ochre. So I'm using two different yellows in the two upper corners. And so once again, my goal is to not have the same thing happening in both corners, something different. As this is drying a little bit, I'm noticing that this is not as dark as I would like it in the center. So I'm actually thickening up the pigment on my palette and I'm gonna darken a little bit in this section where I wanna be looking deeper into the woods that are back there. All right, so I've got to start now. My goal before we take a break is to get most of the areas on this painting started. That underpainting is going to be here no matter what, um, but I want to get paint over most of the, on, on top of most of the underpainting. There may be a few places where the underpainting is left exposed. We'll see what happens. All right, so now it's time for me to paint a few rocks and there's a whole lot of rocks at this place. Um, so I'm gonna start with yellow ochre. I'm sticking with my large-ish, uh, large one inch flat for now. Here's some cerulean blue. Now I gotta tell you that this is one of my favorite combinations on my palette right here. This is yellow ochre, cerulean blue, and cobalt violet deep. I sometimes refer to this as a triad, although it certainly isn't a perfect triad, yellow, red, and blue, but the yellow ochre is yellow-ish. The cobalt violet deep is red-ish and then the cerulean blue. And if I mix these three pigments together, I can get some lovely grays. I try not to mix them too perfectly on the palette. I like to let them mix on the paper. I think it gets more interesting that way. So what I like to do is mix it imperfectly on the palette and just let my brush pick up different uh, combinations or different proportions when I go back to reload my brush. And I get some very interesting, I get some very interesting um, mixtures on the paper by doing that. So what I'm doing now is just brushing some of these paints on the paper and you can see that I'm crossing lots of lines, crossing lots of edges. Um, I don't like to be, um, I don't like to feel like I'm painting in a coloring book. That's the best analogy I can give. And so when I have the opportunity to cross an edge, I like to take that opportunity. And this is the kind of subject where I can cross many edges and just kind of get this color moving through the painting. Now, something I'm going to think about now, I've got most of these rocks, I've got a, a, first, a first pass over them. These rocks that are down towards the bottom of the painting are closer to me. And as I would work my way visually up this hillside, it's getting a little farther away. Keeping kind of in uh, tune, so to speak, with the underpainting that I started, which remember it was cooler at the top and warmer at the bottom. What I'm gonna do, I'm just reminding myself that I want the rocks in general to be a little cooler back up here as they're moving away and a little warmer as I move down towards the bottom. So what I can do now is using these three different pigments again, because they're not completely mixed on my palette. So I can still 
touch one area or another with my brush on the palette and I can warm up. So now very subtly, I've warmed up these rocks that are down here and cooled off these guys that are back here. Another area that I haven't really started yet, and this is um, this is a uh, diversion, so to speak, from my source photo. This little shape right here, I'm painting this as if it's grass. It's not in the source photo. It's not in the actual park. It's just mulch or something that the park people have put down. But I want to suggest that it's a, a little bit of grass back there. So I'm going to, I just use some lemon yellow on my palette. <sighs> I'm just getting a little bit of um, pale yellow right back there. I'm not going too dark yet. We'll just get that, we'll just get that color. We'll just get that color going. Okay, I'm going to switch to a different brush now. And I'm going to this shape right here in my source photo and in my value study, I have a nice big tree. This tree is kind of in the foreground or the, it's not quite the foreground. We would call this the foreground, which is down you know, close to where I was standing, but certainly middle ground. There's a nice, big, um, warm, green tree right about here. And so what I want to do is get this tree going. I'm going to start to create, paint a specific shape now. So I'm starting to paint a specific tree shape. I changed my brush to a large round brush. It has a pretty nice point on it. And what I want to do for starters is just start to paint the shape of the tree. And right here, I'm painting the, um, I'm painting the, the tree itself. This is called positive painting. I'm painting on the shape of the tree. And the tree is here, right here. It's a little bit darker than what's just beneath it in the landscape. So we'll get that green going. All right. Now I'm going to extend this darker green from the center, this darker green. And I'm going to paint, I'm going to cut this in to make the top part of this tree look lighter than the center part of the woods here. And uh, so I'm using, um, before I was using some set green and I had mixed it with a bit of ultramarine blue. Let's use a little bit more of that. And so now what I'm doing is I'm painting darker around the tree here. So the tree's going to read as if it's lighter than this, this deeper part of the woods here. And down here, the tree's going to read as if it is darker than what's beneath it. So two different ways, two different approaches now to um, painting this tree. And while I'm at it, I can go into the tree itself. So now I'm using a mixture of um, both of the greens, the lighter, warmer green with the with the lemon yellow in it, and the darker green with the ultramarine blue in it. And I can get a little more texture happening towards the um, central portion of the tree. So we've got a start on that. Okay. And um, and then this part of the woods at the upper left, I want to show you, I'm sorry, upper right, I just want to show you that I can start lifting some paint. This is where things get really interesting with gessoed paper. So up here in the upper right, 
I want to lift a little paint off to create the suggestion of another tree that's a little bit lighter. So in this case, I'm going to lift paint. All I have to do to lift paint is to take a damp brush and just brush it right through an area. In this case, this is pretty dry. Things are actually drying pretty fast in my studio this afternoon. I'm very pleased. That makes it easier for a demo if I can get the everything drying faster. Um, anyhow, so you can see that I can lift off the paint here. So I've got three different ways now, just to point out to you, three different ways of painting the edges of these various trees. This is positive painting down here, darker against light. This is negative painting up here, uh, where the tree is lighter against dark, and this is lifted off. This is, this is the true beauty of the gessoed paper. All right. Um, moving back down to the waterfall itself and the rocks. Okay, here we go. Things are about to get more interesting. So what I want to show you is with this waterfall here, um, this portion of the waterfall is where it is. Um, it's, it's, it's not really cascading up here. So it's going to stay lighter. Right about here, where my brush is, the waterfall is going to start to come over the edge, over the edge. And you can see that what I'm doing, I'm taking this, uh, this is a half inch flat brush and it's dampened. And I'm gonna pull it right over this edge that I made before, which is pretty hard. It's a pretty hard edge and it's pretty much dry. And I'm going to just pull it right over that edge. And I'm going to pull it down. And you can see that what's happening, actually, let's come in closer for you. All right, here we go. Here comes the waterfall crashing dramatically downwards. Oh, yes. Here it comes. But you can see that I can just pull that waterfall. And I, I'm looking, by the way, I'm looking at my source photo. There, there are some interesting, like, rivulets of water. That's about all we get in this poor little waterfall. Little rivulets of water. And I can, you see, I'm just taking this damp brush and pulling that waterfall just up years. And it gets down to about this point right about here. And it's going to enter the little round pool. And I'll get to that in just a minute. So let's just get a few more of these little trickling rivulets. And with a painting like this, what I can do is I can kind of work back and forth between the lights and the darks until I get the feeling, the actual feeling, um, the, the the feeling of the of the world itself, the feeling of the day, the <laughs> as much drama as I'm able to um, as much drama as I'm able to eke out of this waterfall. Yes, indeed. So there's the waterfall getting started. Now, what I am also going to do, I just want to show you. And so sometimes when I'm when I'm making these paintings on gesso paper, I feel like I'm kind of going back and forth. I'm adding paint. So here I'm adding paint. I want to darken on the right side of this waterfall now. So I'm going back to the 
that same original, that same original combination, the burnt sienna and the ultramarine blue. I actually have a rather interesting shape right here. This is a watermark. I did not draw this shape. It's a watermark. And you know what? It looks like a rock back there underneath the waterfall. I love it. I'm leaving it. I'm going to paint around it. So I'm just adding a bit more of the paint, avoiding that lovely watermark. And I'm going to darken that. I'm also going to darken over here again. Let's make it nice and dark. And I can even darken in between some of these rivulets if I want to. And this will increase the depth and the shadowy feeling on the waterfall. Okay. How are we doing out there in Zoom land? Mike, have there We're been doing fine. We had one question when you're up for it. Yeah, right now. That's I, I was kind of looking for uh, an opportunity to stop talking. Uh, uh, it's an easy question. And the question was from Pam, who wanted to know, is this mainly was applying the gesso? How carefully do you apply it? And is this a uniform application? Uh, OK. Um, when I apply the gesso, I'm going to keep painting while I um, That's while fine. answer this question. When, and, and I'm just darkening. So I'm just darkening here, back here, behind the waterfall. And I'm going to continue the darkness. I, I promise I will answer the question. I'm just going to continue the darkness into this little pool because I want to darken the pool before I'm going to lift off some of the paint in the pool as well. And I want to get it a little bit darker. Um, I apply the I apply the gesso using an old synthetic one inch flat watercolor brush. And when I apply the gesso, I deliberately I brush in all different directions with my gesso brush. And I cover the whole paper. Um, I and so you might say, well, is that careful brushing? And the answer is, well, it's careful in that. I try to cover the, I don't want to miss any spots. I like the entire paper to have a similar feeling beneath my brush. So I'm careful to cover the entire paper, but I don't try to make my strokes. I never try to make them, let's say, all even and horizontal or all even and vertical. They go in every which way. And I let it dry, by the way, it takes about 40, 45 minutes for a, a coating of gesso to dry. And uh, after it dries, I put on a second coat. And when I put on the second coat, I don't try to match the, the strokes up. I put them on all over again in all different directions. So is that careful or not? Well, I, I'll leave that up to you to decide. What was the other part of that question? Uh, she just wanted to know uh, how, uh... Was this was this done uh, carefully? Uh, yeah. I guess it is carefully. Well, carefully in that in that I want to cover the whole piece of paper, but not carefully in terms of lining up the strokes. I, in fact, I deliberately don't want to light up the strokes. So I hope that's an adequate answer. Okay. Uh, there is another another question from. Uh -huh. Let's see. Do you dilute your gesso or use it full strength? Full strength. Full strength. Okay. Um, there's th the only time I dilute it if it's kind of getting old and I feel like it's starting to you know dry up inside the bottle, but that shouldn't happen if you keep the bottle closed. Um, then I might add a few drops of water to it, but generally, no, I don't. I don't dilute it. Full strength. Okay. There is another part to the uh, question. Mm -hmm. How do you create the, f you had that man uh, with white hair and there was <laughs> wisps of his hair. How do you do that? That's called masking fluid applied with a teeny tiny brush. Okay. That's how that's done. Um, and that's done on cold press paper though. So I just want to make sure that, you know, that that's understood. Um, okay. I, I, I do not. I really do not use gesso paper for my figurative paintings, my portraits. Um, that's where that's where I reach for my cold press paper. 
um, and that, and I use masking fluid quite liberally on um, somebody like that bearded guy. Okay, we good? Great. Yep, All fine. Right. Okay. What I'm trying to do now is I'm trying, I'm starting to think about these rocks in a more um, architectural way. Oddly enough, you might think it's odd. I tend to think of rocks as being architectural. They've got corners, they have edges, they've got tops and sides. Um, and I think of them as being architectural. And so what I'm doing now is I'm starting to think about where they're where they have vertical surfaces and where they're facing up towards the sky and what i'm trying to do now is to describe some of these rocks by um, painting them darker on their sides leaving their tops a little bit lighter and they're going to start to take on some form that's my hope um, another thing i might point out to you is that when I paint rocks, I almost always, without even thinking about it, I reach for a flat brush, which is what I use when I'm painting architecture as well. A flat brush somehow seems appropriate for painting these kinds of shapes that are architectural. When I was painting the trees up above, you might have noticed that I grabbed a round brush because that feels more appropriate to me to painting um, curvy, organic, uh, round-ish shapes. So the, the choice of the brush is, all, is frequently, or I might even say always, related to the actual subject that I want to describe. So while I'm talking to you about brushes, I've been working on some of these rocks. And again, I'm just trying to paint some of their uh, more vertical surfaces to try to get some of the form going. I'm painting one vertical surface, for instance, like this one right here. Um, if I paint the vertical surface and I stop, at the top of the next rock that's down below, it will start to uh, describe one rock against another and start to describe and start to create some depth there. How am I doing on time? It's just about five. Oh, you're doing fine. Yeah. I'm you're about halfway about, through. Yeah, I'm just wondering about taking a break in a minute or two. Take a break. I want to do just a little bit more and then we will take a break. So I just want to hit a couple of these other rocks that are down here in the foreground. So down here at the bottom, of course, this is right in front of, you know, right at my feet when I was standing there taking this picture. So I just want to get some of these rocks reading better. And they're starting, they're starting to emerge. Before I take my break, I want to do one more thing. And I want to get a little more darkness right in here. Right down here. This is another place in this uh, scene where the water is just pouring over this little waterfall here. So I want to get a little more um, darkness so that I can lift off that, that another piece of waterfall for you um, right here. And one more hit of darkness up here. I haven't said the word focal area yet, this afternoon, have I? No. Focal area, focal area is something that uh, I think most paintings, not all, but most paintings certainly benefit from a focal area. 
that I um, that I'm thinking about and that I'm developing. And the focal area is the part of the painting which is most important. It's the central part of the story. It's the most important part. It's where I want my viewer to look first and last and longest. And so what I like to do with a focal area, I, and I think this is really great advice for everybody is get your darkest darks and your lightest lights in and around your focal area and it acts like a giant magnet pulling your viewer right in there. So my focal area is meant to be this one major portion of this little tiny waterfall. And so this is where I'm gonna develop my darkest darks and my lightest lights. And so I wanted to just smack in a little bit more dark. Now remember also, remember, this is one of those areas in the painting because it's on gesso paper, the dark may start to get a little bit opaque looking. That's normal. That's what happens on the gesso paper. So, um, you know, that's just one of the things you have to get used to on the gesso paper. I think this is a good stopping point. So um, uh, Mike and Carol, whoever is doing the, um, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a minute. Whoever is in charge of the recording, I don't know if you want to just um, pause it for a minute. Let's take five minutes, everybody run and get another cup of coffee and then come back, <laughs> please, okay? All right? Okay. So about five, about five minutes and I'll get back to it. That's fine. Yeah, okay. Deb, can you get your parents to do some tricks or something in this waiting time? <laughs> ah, doubtful. They do what they do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can get Alex. <laughs> hey, you. Hey. Here. I oh. Here he is, the chewer of wood. <laughs> the subject of some of my paintings. Yep. You're wearing wood. Yeah. How many birds do you have, Debbie? Two. <laughs> Only two? Seems like a lot more. You did have another one. I did. He passed at the beginning of December. Ah. Uh, was he the one who was sick? Yeah. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That one's a beauty. Uh, yeah, he's 31. Wow. He has Is that normal? Good. How long do they last? 25 wow. to 30. Yeah. Wow. So every day I uncover him is a good day. So this is all being recorded. I didn't stop the recording. I figured. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Crazy, that's fine. Alex. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. I'm glad to see everybody. Hi, Pamela Lynch. And user is Betty Stanton. <laughs> I love it. Who's iPad? That's me. No, there must be more than one iPad. There's Val's iPad. <laughs> and there's, yeah. And there's just plain iPad. Yeah, plain iPad. I don't know. Oh, yeah. yours says Val's iPad on it. Yeah. I'm afraid to touch the buttons here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do anything. Could be me. So they didn't have a reception time planned. I thought I saw that it was 12 to 2. So that's not decided yet, huh? Well, if, what's it say? Does it say 12 to 2 on the prospectus? It said to, to be a determined on the prospectus. Okay. It might be 12 to 2. Yeah, it usually is there, 12 to 2. We'll, we'll let people know in plenty of time. Sure. How, 
I, I've been working on a painting. You want to see it? Sure. Yeah. How can I show it to you? Pick up my I, iPad? No, you but... don't have to do anything. Just okay, oh. show us. Well, it's, it's over here. Let's see. I didn't think I would get this done for the new show. Do you see that? Yeah. Oh, pretty, pretty wow. uh, difficult. <laughs> so very nice. Do you know what it is? Koi. Yeah. Love it. I was trying to do some movement there, and I'm trying to. Uh, knock back the whites, you know, but um, I don't know. You got a, you got a uh, nice from Steve Sideri. Good. So Steve, do you pronounce the E in your name or is it just Steve Sideri? I don't know if he'll, he'll probably try to unmute himself and say something. <laughs> I can get started again. It's been about five minutes. All okay, right. that's fine. Yes. The recording's still on. So I will give you a question, uh, Alexis, before you start. Sure, Mike, One more sure. question, which was, um, are there some watercolor societies who will not accept gesso paper? Yes, there are. So you just really need, if you, you know, if you're getting ready to enter um, an exhibition, read the prospectus really carefully. Sure, that'll tell you. And uh, it may or may not say, you know, if it says something like, for instance, Transparent Watercolor Society of America, I'm sure they absolutely wouldn't accept it because it's not 100% watercolor. Um, and, and if you're in doubt, there's almost always somebody that you can call or send an email to and just ask. Sure. Um, so we have, a, we have a water media show every few years. And um, we accept all kinds of, of paper. Rice water paper. media. If yeah. it's if it's water media, that is usually a, a wider category. Yes. Yes. And that probably would not be a problem. But if it's yeah. you know meant to be a hundred percent watercolor only, that's where you can run into problems. Yeah. That's the way it is for us too. Okay. I'm going to go back over to the painting. <clears throat> so here we are. All right. So what during the break, I took a good look at this thing and I decided that I want to try to lift off some more paint on this waterfall right here. I have, um, I'm very sad that you don't want me to go and everybody does it. Um, honey. No, honey, what? You didn't say. We got somebody that ought to be muted. That's fine. No, I didn't say to them about that. Somebody needs to mute there, please. That would be that would be helpful. Okay. Well, I just I decided, I decided that I want to lift off more paint. This is not light and bright enough. I remember I said in my focal area, I want my darkest darks and my lightest lights. And so I'm just going to work this area a little more vigorously. This is a slightly stiffer brush. It's This is a watercolor brush. It is. This is a Princeton, um, it's called a Princeton Select. It, that's the name of the line of brushes, Princeton Select, but it's a watercolor brush. It's not like, um, it's not a true scrubber, but it is a little bit stiffer than some of my other brushes. And I'm using it damp. You have to dampen or nothing's going to happen. But you can see that by working this area just a little more vigorously, I can get some more of this paint right up. I'm virtually back to white um, exposed gesso right here. This would not happen on cold press paper. Even if you're scrubbing like crazy, you are not likely to be able to expose pure white watercolor paper ever again. 
Unless, of course, if you use masking fluid, but that's the beauty of the gesso paper. You don't need to use masking fluid. So you can see that by working this paint a little more, just a little more uh, decidedly, if you will, I can get the paint off and I can get this waterfall really sparkly and white. And that's what I want to do. Let's continue this waterfall now. I'm just going to take it up and over the edge here. And I'm going to pull it here. I'm going to pull it right around the top of this rock. And remember what I said before, that some of my underpainting might remain exposed even when the painting's done. And here's a place where I think I'm going to leave the underpainting so the surface of this rock right here is the underpainting. And I think that would be a lovely place to um, not paint on top of. So that's where the underpainting is going to remain. Here is another place right on the side of this rock on the left. Again, I'm lifting the paint off. Right in here, what I'm essentially doing is lifting off the underpainting but I'll leave it on the rocks. So I'm lifting off the underpainting here to lighten the water as it's coming down the waterfall or down the hillside. Um, and the contrast now between the lifted area back to the gesso surface and the underpainting is going to do it for me right there right along the top of the main waterfall where the where the water is just kind of coming down over the edge i want to soften it and again the gessoed surface is just beautiful for softening all i have to do is push that paint ever so slightly and it just softens right there so I can soften that. I love working the edges in my painting, by the way, so that I have a variety of edges, some of which are softer, some of which are harder. I think that helps to create interest and description. Um, and it's also good design. Okay, now down here, I want to move down here into this little pool. So there's kind of a little circular pool right down here and the this little waterfall comes down into the pool and so there are some kind of <clears throat> circular rings of water moving around this pool this is why i wanted to get the uh, paint dark enough before knowing that I wanted to pull off the rings of water to show you and the gesso, you know, what can I say? The gesso surface just works great for that. So I'm just lifting some of them off, thinking in terms of that, um, you know, that basic circular feeling. At the base of the waterfall right here, I need to bring some more of the water down from the top. <clears throat> so I'm just going to drag some more of that off. I'm going to wipe it a little bit. By the way, I, I do want to mention that I, I don't use paper towels for blotting and wiping. I, I like to use cloth towels, cotton towels that are very absorbent like this old thing right here. And I think it works great for scrubbing and lifting and blotting. And what I'm gonna do now is I need to get some of the splashing action at the bottom of this waterfall where it hits the little pool. I wanna get some of the paints, uh, some of the water splashing back up and so I'm just pushing now with my brush, pushing upwards. I'm essentially just shoving that paint when I'm pushing it like that 
I'm just kind of shoving the paint upwards and I can use the towel once I've, once I've dampened it to kind of loosen it, I can use the towel to almost to just kind of push it backwards back up. And here's something out. Oh, wait, let's just get a little more off right here. I'm just kind of pushing this little brush all over the surface. There we go. Now, the other thing I want to show you that's really fun down here to make some of these um, the splashes. Here's my trusty, nasty old toothbrush. And I use this toothbrush usually for spattering on paint, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. But what I'm going to do first is just spatter on some water. So I load up the brush with water. I give it a couple of taps on my water bucket. That dislodges any really ginormous blobs of water in here. I aim the brush at the surface of the paper and pull my fingers over the brush, and it just shoots out a lovely stream of random little dots of water. I'm going to let those little dots sit on the surface of the paper for a couple of, couple of minutes or a few seconds, and then I'm just going to blot it with my towel. I'm going to come in a little closer and watch what happens when I blot it with my towel. Can you see all the little the little white dots emerging. Awesome. Yeah. Isn't that the coolest thing ever? Yeah. Do it again. I want a little more splashing action. All right. So let's do it one more time. And I can do this, you know, as many times as I want. Just splashing on a little more water. We'll try it again. Just let it sit there. Soften up some of that paint. With the gesso surface, the paint there sometimes is a little bit that gets absorbed, but hardly ever, it's kind of just sitting there on the surface. So when you soften it up with some water applied from your brush or water applied with a toothbrush like that, then you just wipe it right off and it works so well. Okay. It's really so cool. Was that a question? Did I hear a question? Just a comment that it was really cool. Oh, yeah, it is really cool. I hope I'm turning everybody on to this wonderful surface. I really yes, hope so. You are. Um, all right, so the pool is developing. Um, in the amount of time that I have here tonight, everybody, I'm not going to get this painting finished. My goal, though, is to show you enough about how it's going to proceed so that you'll have a sense of how this will develop um, and also you know, really just giving you um, the a, an appreciation for this surface. That's what I'm really trying to do here. I'm gonna pull a couple more trickles down. So here's, this is gonna be another trickle of water and then I'll just wipe it and there it is, another, another trickle. Um, the lower waterfall that I talked about that I mentioned before the break is down here. And so once again, I just want to show you that from this lower waterfall, let's take some water right here. So here's some water that I just dragged off right here. And then I'm going to pull some of it down. I'm just going to take this little brush. This is that same um, Princeton Select brush. And dampened again. And this little waterfall, this is just a little tiny thing. You know, you people who live in, near Niagara Falls, you're probably laughing at me every time I call this a waterfall. This is, I have to tell you, this is a lovely waterfall. It's not thunderous, but it's lovely. <laughs> no, it's definitely not thunderous. Um, it is rather sweet. It is rather sweet. Um, so this little tiny waterfall right here, it's just kind of broken. I don't want it to be too solid down here, but we'll just let it come down here. And then of course it can move down this way and it will eventually move down here and out the 
at the bottom of the painting. I'll just show you another way that I can lift a little more paint off on the surface. And that is I take my towel. Now this towel has been used many, many times. When it gets too filled up with paint, I just throw it in the washing machine, by the way. So it's got lots of stains on it. I'm gonna try to find a place that looks cleaner. Stick, stick it around my finger. And all I have to do is just take it now and drag it through, drag it through the paint and it pushes the paint off and creates another feeling of um, the, the water moving. Okay, let's see what's happening. I'm gonna zoom out now so that we can see what's happening with the whole painting. And what I'd like to do now is to take a few minutes and work on these rocks a little bit more. I wanna get a little bit more form and depth going. And so I'm gonna start right about under here. I'm looking at my source photo now. I just want you to know that I am looking at my source photo to get an idea of where uh, of, of how these rocks are mm, stacked. You know, as I said, these were all placed there by a, by a landscape architect, I suppose, who designed this lovely place. So these, these rocks were all put there and placed very carefully. And they do look rather, I will say, they look very natural. If you have ever come to Greensboro, North Carolina, and if you were to walk into this park and walk up to this waterfall, you might not even suspect that it hasn't been there forever. I should tell you that Steve thinks it's more picturesque than Niagara Falls. <laughs> Seriously? That's what he said. Well, well, thank you, Steve. Um, so anyhow, I am trying, you know, I'm looking again, I'm looking at my source photo and I'm seeing places where there are some like spaces in between the rocks. And this is where I want to darken a little bit. So I'm just darkening in there. Um, and, you know, cracks in between them. I just want to give just a little bit more interest. I am thinking about my focal area. And so I just want to say, I always keep that in mind. And I don't want to get things too interesting. If this is my focal area here, as I move away to the sides or the top and the bottom or the corners, I don't want to get, I don't want to keep too much interest going. Okay, so over here, for instance, I've got a dark, there's a dark place underneath. This is meant to be an overhanging rock right here. I don't want to go as dark as I've got it here. So my darkest darks, I'm going to just keep reminding myself, are meant to be here near my focal area. Quiet them down as I move out to the edges of the painting. Here's another rock that I want to get going. So I'm going to glaze. So I'm glazing now. And oh, I forgot to mention. It was in, you know, when I showed you that um, word, pick, you know, that word slide earlier with all the characteristics of gesso paper. One of the things on there was, <clears throat> how is gesso paper for glazing? And so the answer is, and it's on that paper, it's not quite as easy to glaze on gesso paper as it is on untreated watercolor paper. And I think you can probably appreciate the reason for that now because it's so easy to lift. If I glaze too vigorously with too, you know, if I push too hard on my brush when I'm glazing, I might remove the paint instead of glazing. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. It, yeah. So with glazing, and what I'm doing now essentially is I'm glazing over some of these rock shapes to darken them, to give them, in, in this case here, I want to 
darken it to give it more of a vertical feel, this one right here, and to give it a little bit of texture. Um, I'm using a delicate touch. I don't shove the brush too hard on the surface and then it glazes just fine. So you just need to kind of mm, modulate your touch a little bit and it's, and it's really going to work just fine. Here's a rock. I'm actually looking at my source photo now and I always have to qualify, you know, and I say, well, I don't believe in copying my source photo. No, no, no. I interpret it. But when I see something in my source photo that I really like, well, yeah, I might just put it in my painting. What I like is I'm looking at a rock that's kind of in this vicinity in my source photo and it's rather green. Like there's a lot of moss growing on it. So let's Let's add some green to this one. So in my palette, you can see right here, I've got some green paint. This is a mixture of lemon yellow and a bit of sap green, pretty much. I'm gonna put a little bit on this one right here, just to add a little hint of green. And you can see I'm kind of pushing it around with my finger. I love to do that. I love to push paint with my finger. And sometimes on gesso paper, in fact, if I just touch it with my finger, it makes some nice texture. So I'll do that. So now I've got just a little hint of green on this rock over here. Here's another one. Oops, let's make sure you can see it in your Zoom screen. Here's another one right here that also has a little bit of green. So again, with that delicate touch, I'm just gonna glaze a little bit of green. And it just adds a little bit of color right there. Okay, so let's see, the rocks are developing more. Now, speaking of green, let's go up to the top of the painting. This is not my focal area, but it is important to the story that I'm telling because this um, sweet little waterfall is in a wooded park and uh, and I want to express that you know this is this is the place this is part of the place and so I'm going to um, use um, one of my uh, favorite if you will watercolor techniques for creating texture right here and that is dry brush and dry brush works just fine on gesso paper. So what I'm doing now is I'm just loading my brush up. I'm using a three quarter inch flat and I'm getting it, loading it up with paint. Now this paint is not terribly fluid on my palette. It's a little drier, which you want if you're gonna do dry brush. So with dry brush, you want to make sure that the surface that you're painting upon right here, I'm going to paint on this grassy area. That needs to be dry and the brush needs to be dry-ish. Now you can see that the brush still looks nice and shiny. There's plenty of moisture in there. But what I like to do is I touch it to my towel back and forth a couple of times and that soaks, it sucks out some of the moisture. And then I even split the hairs of the brush with my fingernail. And then what I can do is make some strokes. And in this case, I'm just making strokes kind of straight up and down. And um, let's make, let's see if you can see this. It's a little too shiny. Let's try this again shiny because it was probably too wet. Let's try this again. The thing I love about dry brush is that with this one technique, I can, can you see the dry brush strokes here? I think you can yes. see it. What am I, there you go. Sometimes I just have to tip the, the painting ever so slightly so that it shows up better in the in the camera. Here I'm splitting the brush again. With the dry brush, what I what you can do with the dry brush, you can do three things at the same time. Oh boy, isn't that great? Three things at once. You can add texture, which is what I'm doing. I want to make this look kind of grassy. 
So you can add texture because the dry brush strokes just create texture. At the same time, I can adjust color so I can make it greener and I can also make it darker all at the same time. So I can adjust color and value and add texture all with one, uh, one technique. How perfect is that? And it works really nicely on gesso paper. So I've got to start now on this grassy area. And in fact, something else that I really want to do there, I just thought of it. I hadn't really been specifically planning it, but I just thought of it. One thing I haven't mentioned up until now is, um, is there a strong feeling of light and shadow? This was kind of an overcast day when I took this photograph. And so there isn't a strong feeling of the light, let's say, coming from the left or coming from the right. But let's anyhow, let's just darken a couple of places. You know, I was just saying that with dry brush, you can darken the value. So I just want to show you how it works. Maybe it's not the right thing for this painting, but for those of you who are going to try this on your own subject, let me just show you that with the dry brush, what I can do is add a few darker dry brush strokes. You see what's happening here? All of a sudden now, it's starting to look like a little bit of shadow raking across this grassy area um, from some of the overhanging trees. So just to show you that technique as well. Um, something else I wanna show you is a spattering of color and I spattered with water down here to give you the, the um, you know, lifting off the um, color. Um, but let's go for some spattering of actual paint. And so I'm mixing up kind of a warm grayish color in the toothbrush now. And where am I going to spatter? I'm going to go back to these two big rocks over here. I really like these two rocks. Let's get a little spatter on them. So this time I'm applying color or pigment, not really applying color, I'm applying pigment right on here, just spattering. And it gives a really nice feeling of some nice rough texture on these rocks. This one over here, now if I spatter in one place in the painting, I'm going to do it again. I'm not going to just do it once. Let's get a little spatter on this guy over here. Oftentimes when I spatter, let's see, where am I going to do some more spatter? Um, I'm going to do some spatter right over here on the edge of this. Um, rock right here. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll cover an adjacent area with my hand or with my towel or with uh, a piece of paper or cardboard and it protects the adjacent area if I don't want the spatters to go everywhere. Let's get some spatters going here. Here's a good place to get some spatter going. And I'm going to show you what I sometimes do. Instead of just saying it, I'm going to show you. So here, here's a rock. And I started making this rock. And you can see it's kind of got a hump on it. So I've got all these. See these things? These are all old postcards. And I cut them all up with funny shapes on them. And I use them, and you can see they're all covered with spatters of paint. Can you see that? These are my um, protection postcards, if you will. So I can take a postcard like this and put it down like this, and another one like this. Oh, boy. And now these postcards now are going to protect what's underneath them. I'm just getting some paint in my brush. Here we go. I'm mixing up again, warm-ish gray. What I'm gonna do now is spatter right up to the edge of the postcard. So it's gonna create the texture 
and a little bit of darkening on the um, <clears throat> the rock that's above the postcards. I just want to get a little bit more in. Okay, and then I carefully like peel off the postcards, and there's the edge reveal. And so, so this is a good trick for you to know. Um, I don't get into too many tricky things when I paint, but that's kind of a tricky thing. All right, so how is this coming? I need to darken right here, this rock right here. So I darkened this one here with the spatter. Right here, I want to darken this guy. So I'm darkening this one that's above. And if I darken to the edge of the next one down, it just pops right out. And I'm going to darken this one almost to the edge of this little pool. Actually, I'm going to cross the edge into the next one. That's the green one that I painted before. Yeah, let's cross the edge and let's keep crossing edges. Oh, yes. All the way into my darker focal area. All right. Where do I need to work on this? This is really down here. I need to, I need to get this definitely working a little bit better. I want to be able to see I've got two or three rocks right here that are coming in front of this pool. So I either need to darken the pool or I need to darken the rocks or make a color change from one to the other. I think what I'm going to do is darken the water, the pool, right here, right to the edge of the rock, right there. Just darken it like that. So that the rocks start to pop out. And then these rocks right here, I'm going to get them hopefully to read by darkening what's behind them. So I'm using some contrasts in value mostly to get the shapes to read. Let's darken one more time right up here. Remember, this is not my focal area. I want this area to read though, because it's going to help to set up some depth for me. So I want it to read, I want the shapes to read, but I don't want them to be as important as this. So even though I'm using darker value, and I'm going to darken here one more time, even though I'm using darker value, it's not going to be this dark, just dark enough so that this starts so that you can really see the shape. And then darken again on the vertical sides of these rocks. Because this is meant to be kind of a big flat one out there towards the, um, towards the bottom. Okay, this waterfall is starting to develop um, a few more places. I'm gonna use a smaller brush. I'm looking for my half inch flat. And I want to work my way back kind of into the distance. There's a whole bunch of more rocks back here. I'm just going now uh, towards the, you know, where this waterfall kind of curves around and goes behind this tree. So I just want to get a few more of these nice shapes on some of those rocks. And that's also helping to show the the edge of this little stream that's carrying that's carrying the waterfall. Um, as I go back now into the landscape back there, I just want to show you, I'm going to put a tree in back here. Let's put a tree in. So I'm going to lift it off. 
let's do that. Lift it up right through the right through the forest. Okay, I'm just gonna put this tree as if it's kind of growing right along the edge. <clears throat> right along the edge of the um this grass. Uh, I do this is not drawn in. I'm just drawing with my brush now. I'm drawing with my brush that just has water in it, by the way. Just water. I'm not trying here to lift completely back to white paper, just a little bit. So I'm trying, I want to leave some of the green, you know, I have this green that I put on before. So I want to leave some of that there. Let's blot it a bit. Okay, so now you can see that tree, it's starting starting to read. Um, so I want it to be a little bit lighter. Mm -hmm. And I can let some of the, uh, if I'm putting branches in, I always like to break them. You know, I don't want it to look too uh, solid because in the woods, there are always breaks in the branches. I don't mean that the branches themselves are broken, but they're breaks in the, you know, some of the foliage is coming in front of the trees. So I, I kind of think of it almost like a, <clears throat> a dashed line. All right, so we'll get this tree coming in. So now I've got a tree there in, in the background. And of course, if I put one tree in, I probably should put in a second one. Let's just put in a second one right over here. You know, just so it's not just one tree in the woods. We'll get another one started. Um, if you're painting on gesso paper, by the way, you know, and you do something like this and you go, oh, darn, I didn't want the tree right there. Well, you can always just paint right over it again and, um, and start over. Um, so don't, you know, it, it's a very, it's a very forgiving surface. Okay, so there's another, tr another tree started and and then once you get if i lift off the paint like from these trees i can always come back in now with a little warm paint and just come back in if i feel like the trees look they just look too cold you know i lifted them off and deliberately left some of that green showing i can always come back in with a little warm this is just a little bit of um, burnt sienna mostly warm it right warm it right back up so now we've got a little bit of forest back here um, I'm going to embellish the forest just a little bit and with just a little more just a little more um, intense color so there is a little bit of lemon yellow do you notice by the way I just thought I'd mention I haven't said it yet tonight this afternoon that I don't, I don't, uh, I never really, I can, I hesitate to use the words never and always, but I can pretty safely say I never take my paper down. I do not like to. Um, I much prefer to keep my paper not even clipped. I like it to be loose so that I can pick it up and handle it. I can turn it if I want to paint sideways or upside down. Sometimes I even curl the paper to get the paint to move in a particular way. If I need to, I always have clips handy. So I just want to show you if I need to, sure, I can clip my paper down. And what made me think of it is that right here in the upper right corner, it is kind of curling up a little bit. So this is a time when, yeah, maybe I want to put the clip on just to hold it down. Um, but aside from that, I really like to just leave the paper loose. And uh, so I can get my hands on it. I really like to do that. I'm trying to add just a little bit of texture. Remember, this tree's in the foreground. So I'm just trying to add a little bit of texture just to give the suggestion of some more of the foliage. And I can also, since this one is closest to us, 
closer than these guys, for instance, that are back here, I can get a few branches going. And um, now here, I was lifting off branches. So the branches of the trunks here are lighter than what's behind them because I was lifting. In this case, I'm going to paint the branches directly using a small, I'm going to use a small pointed brush. And so I can just paint them in. And once again, I don't have any lines. I'm just kind of drawing with my brush. Feel free, by the way, I will say that if you're painting on this surface and you want to do additional drawing, as long as the painting is dry, I never recommend drawing on a, on a wet painting. Although if you're using something like watercolor pencils, drawing on a wet painting could be very interesting. But if you're drawing with graphite, um, I always recommend waiting until the painting is dry, but you can draw, you can draw in the beginning before you've painted or before you've made your underpainting. You can draw later. Let's say at stage two, you can draw again at stage three. No problem. As much or as little as you need to. So there's just some branches in the tree and, um, I'm actually going to smudge a few of them out with my finger. I think I put in too many while I was talking. So I'll just smudge a few out. And another thing I pretty much, I really like to do if I'm doing a tree is, yeah, a little bit of spatter again. So this is a nice way to repeat the spatter. You know, I had it on the rocks below. Well, I can do a little spatter on the tree. So now I'm spattering with green. And so it's a nice, repetition of that, the use of that spatter technique. And there you have it. And it's about 10 till six here in North Carolina, probably 10 to six for most of you. So yes, it is. A good time to stop and um, kind of wrap things up. So here's where it is, um, not done. But hopefully it's um, given you some good ideas about this surface, which you might have not tried before. And hopefully it's just kind of got you all excited and you just want to try it. Actually, I have to tell you that there were a couple of comments, compliments on uh, the, the, uh, the other style that you introduced people to. Uh, frankly, I never thought too much about painting on gessoed uh, paper, but I, I think this was terrific. There were beautiful ripples, somebody else said. Fabulous demo, appreciate a new surface. So there were some great. very positive comments. Thank you very much. That's that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to um, share the screen one more time. And, and I just wanted to um, mention to you that um, if, if you would like to ever come back and, and take an actual class or a workshop with me, I would love that. And um, I, I, I teach, I've been teaching for Cheap Joe's online since the start of the pandemic. And in fact, this year, 2024, um, the, I'm doing a total of six workshops. I've already done two for them. These are the next two coming up in, um, May, I'll be teaching how to make a vignette. And then in July, color theory, which is a really super workshop. And I also wanted to mention that I, I teach three classes every week right here in my studio on Zoom. And I just happen to have a brand new session starting, guess what, next week. Um, I teach on Monday mornings Monday evenings and Tuesday mornings. My two morning classes, as you can see, are both filled, but I do have spaces available next Monday evening. You could start next Monday evening, woohoo. So I just wanted to mention that to you. Um, and if you wanna just kind of look at this real quick and um, and then you can send me an email. So thank you, Nifwas. <laughs> Is that what you said? I have one, one more question. 
<laughs> yes. Uh, uh, one of one of the viewers wanted to know, and I think you said this in the beginning, the triad, but they wanted to know what's your palette. My palette. Mm, you mean that's what, the question. All the all the pigments on my palette. You mean? No, I think um, just I could only guess. That's... What's the plastic palette that you use? Oh, the actual palette. Oh, it's a wonderful palette. I love this palette. This is um, I got this from Cheap Joe's. I actually get most of my most of my supplies from Cheap Joe's, um, and this is called the Miller's Workhorse, and it's really it's a very nice palette. It's got um, large slanted wells, which make it easy to drag the paint out of the wells. And it has, um, it has a, a double lid. So there's tons of mixing space on this palette. I pretty much never use the lid. I like to mix right in the middle of my pigments. So this is pretty much all I ever use for mixing. But if you like to mix huge quantities of paint, you can. And then just to show you, it has this blue line is a gasket, a rubber gasket. So when you close this palette up, the gasket gives it an airtight seal and it's, you know, your, your paints will never dry out. So it's really a great palette. Miller's so Workhorse. Miller's Workhorse? Miller's Workhorse okay. from Cheap Joe's. Yeah. So, um, oh, back to my thank you screen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then I did want to just um, ask if anybody had more questions that you just want to ask me, you know, now face to face, so to speak, as opposed to feeling like you have to put it into a chat message. Be sure and unmute yourself before you try to speak. <laughs> that helps. Um, somebody's raising a hand. Do you see that? Um, I I Lynn Davis, I, I unmute yourself. I, yeah, I can't unmute people. They have to do that themselves. So my question, you're you're also a portrait artist. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Can you hear Oh, you're also a portrait artist, is that right? I paint portraits some sometimes, yes. I'm not primarily I have I, I do love this um this style. I've used it and actually won an award once for the painting I did with the gessoed watercolor. But my question is if you were gonna do um portrait the skin tones and have do you come up with any um do you come up do you see that this this uh practice would be advantageous in portraits? Do you mean you mean working on gessoed watercolor paper? Yeah, yeah. I think that you could paint just about anything on gessoed watercolor paper. I really do. However, when I paint portraits or figurative paintings, I almost always use cold press paper because I feel that the kind of control and fine tuning that I want to do on figurative paintings, I need cold press paper. Um, I tend to use um, gessoed paper for landscapes, architecture, outdoor, more outdoor kind of subjects that have lots of interesting textures. And as sure. I said, I love to use gessoed paper for my abstract paintings. Um, because I I just love to be able to put paint on and then pull it off. Oh yeah, put paint on and pull it off, and it's it lends itself so beautifully to the way the kind of intuitive. It's like when when yeah. I when I paint abstracts, I feel like it's kind of like controlled intuition. <laughs> it's like yeah. two opposite two opposite ways of thinking. And the and the um, the gesso paper is just perfect for that. Yeah, thank you. I kind of got sidetracked there, didn't I? Did I answer your question? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. It's a it's a wide open field with the um the abstracts are also of interest to me, and I I loved hearing that that you just take away, add, take away, and end yeah. up with something it's beautiful. Like I always feel like I'm adding paint and then I'm subtracting, adding, subtracting, you know, and keep kind of right. go back and forth and back and forth until 
at some point it all kind of comes together. <laughs> Sometimes it does. It's not for me all the time though, but thank you. You're welcome. Alexis, Have a good night. Alexis, um, there was a question about whether you would make available the your final when you when you finish working on it. Sure. If sure. You could email I can do it that. To me, I can get it out to everybody. They can see sure. what you do. I'm happy I'm happy to I'm happy to do that. Th this painting, if um I think I will finish this painting. Um, but it you know, you know, with a demo like this, it's like rush, 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 you know. Yeah. So what I to finish it, what I really want to do is sit down quietly and careful more carefully. Um uh, I actually am a pretty careful painter, which goes back to my training as a medical illustrator. Sure. Um, and so to finish this, I would like to give it the kind of slower, more careful, more thoughtful, in, you know, con contemplative feeling treatment. Um, well, you, you may not have been able to do a painting in a contemplative fashion, but I have to tell you, uh, there are really a lot of compliments on uh, what you did. That's great. I'm so glad to hear that. See, what did Deb say she wanted to have shared? Let's see. I didn't quite get that. Uh, if you could <laughs> share that link to the YouTube video of applying the gesso. I'll be ha I will be happy to do that. Uh, once again, I can, um, Carol, I would you me. like me to send it to you and you can yeah. send it out to folks? Sure, that yeah, that worked great. That. Yeah. Thank you. This was wonderful. Yeah. Very nice, Alexis. Great job. Thank you. Now Thank I'm you. going to finally stop the recording. I love this after the, the question and the answer period is very helpful also. So stopping the recording.